Hey, what's up everybody? It's the Super Sleuth here and I got some awesome news for you. We now have a YouTube channel and we want you guys to be a part of it. Right now we're uploading that YouTube channel with awesome clips from previous interviews that we've done, but we plan on launching exclusive content specifically for YouTube on that channel. So what you need to do is you need to subscribe to that channel. All right, welcome back to part two, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultus, where we are talking about the nature of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, the cultish nature of misinformation, media manipulation. I'm very excited for part two of this conversation. As always, I'm joined with Andrew, the super sleuth of the show. Uh, we are also joined by Paul, who is coming to us from Ohio, and then also Jacoby, and you are, what time is it there now in Ukraine? It's 3.29 uh, p.m., and what time is it there right now? Oh. 1.29 a.m. the next day. <sighs> okay. Yeah, so help us understand. I'm very fascinated by this, so give us your thoughts. When I So when I think of Vladimir Putin, I've jokingly said I'm surprised he hasn't been casted as a Bond villain in any of the da recent Daniel Craig films. I mean, he just seems that he has the ideal part. I mean, he's this guy who's this former KGB agent. There's videos of him where he's doing PR stuff, where he's on a horse, he's like riding a horse, totally shirtless and jacked. jacked. I'm sure no PEDs were involved in the uh, involvement in the production of that uh, picture. You know, you have uh, you know picture of him doing judo. There's pictures of him like hunting white tigers, and you know he's almost as cold a personality. Um, how would you like when you first how how do you how would you even begin to describe like who Vladimir Putin is? He is a uh, a man. who, uh, as you mentioned, he was a KGB agent in the, uh, the Soviet Union. And he is from a generation of Russians that uh, came to prominence in the chaos that unfolded after the fall of the Soviet Union. And he is a particular kind of personality that uh, is able to thrive in chaos in a way in which he's able to build a political structure amongst all the craziness that's happening and it's a political structure in which the most evil people rise to the top. So, a uh, very evil man, uh, very manipulative, believes he's above the law. This is interesting. His uh, ex-wife wrote a book about, you know, their marriage back when they were KGB agents. And she'd talk about, you know, they weren't supposed to, but they just kind of up and uh, <laughs> left Germany and went to Turkey or whatever on vacation. <laughs> No, no, no real uh, regard for the law. So super corrupt, um, doesn't hold to honest democracy. Uh, he and uh, Medvedev kind of uh, switched back and forth between two offices. So he's managed to get in control of Russia and stay in control. Uh, so the ultimate thug, uh, not a good guy. One thing that is concerning is that... Uh, he has cancer. Uh, there was a rumor that went around a couple months ago that he fell down and soiled himself, which is a sign that the cancer has uh, gotten to be rather advanced. The degree to which we can trust these rumors is uh, questionable. But if that's the case, then he could be on his deathbed right now. And uh, he's at a per particular point in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you just sort of live for uh, self-actualization. He's like the extreme of that. So he's very evil. He's got access to a lot of weapons and stuff. And uh, he sort of strikes me as just being a man who's able to play and do what he wants. So uh, with no real regard for the lives of his fellow Russians, he's, he's carrying a lot of wicked acts. The concerning thing about him perhaps dying soon from cancer or a bullet or whatever the case may be is that as a man who was able to build a structure in chaos, uh, that takes a particular personality type. But the person who can rise to the top in that system could very well be worse than the architect of the system itself. So whoever it is that Putin has lined up to come next could be even worse than he is. So that's the concern. Yeah. So short answer, Putin is a bad guy. Right. <laughs> yeah. So in other words, it's, it's, uh, what you, you'd be concerned about then. It's just really his, um, 
his the vacuum that might be filled in his absence because I was listening to a yep. podcast I think it was uh, somebody on the Lex Friedman podcast that was being interviewed and he was basically saying that Putin has already lived the full life of the average Russian male which I think is 69 years old how old is he right now oh he's older than dirt <laughs> he's in his 80s isn't he I can google that yeah he's, he's up he's up there he was in the Berlin Wall fell when he oh. was early 20s Mm-hmm. He's only 70. Oh. Coming up on 71. Right. Yeah, and so let me ask you this in regards to religiosity. So we had never really talked about Ethan Orthodoxy before. Explain, uh, go ahead, explain what that is in conjunction to historical, like Protestantism. Um, and also, how does, how, is that, how does that fit into uh, Putin in regards to this whole conflict. This is the theological part that you sort of briefly oh, mentioned in part one. So you just asked for uh, 2,000 years of church history. Yeah, <laughs> just very clear. <laughs> so there's a lot of similarities with uh, Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism from the, the Protestant perspective. Um, they uh, both claim to have their origins and preservation from the, the early church. The... Split between Eastern Orthodoxy and uh, Roman Catholicism was an East-West split. So Catholicism was the Roman Church. Orthodoxy was the Greek Church. Mm -hmm. Okay, so about 900s, a couple of missionaries go to Ukraine from Greece and start developing an Eastern Orthodoxy in Ukraine. Then with time, Ukraine gets baptized. Uh, which means it became Eastern Orthodox, which is interesting. Whenever we read the Bible, the conversion to Christianity is always an individual matter. Have, have you believed in Christ, you, yourself? Uh-huh. Um, Eastern Orthodoxy sees it as a, a national matter. So Greece was Eastern Orthodox, then Ukraine became Eastern Orthodox. Uh, before it was called Ukraine, it was called uh, Kiev Rus. Then uh, Ukrainian Orthodoxy had a church plant go seriously wrong. That church plant was the Russian Orthodox Church. So Russian Orthodoxy is tied into this whole Eastern Orthodox thing. One difference between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism is that Roman Catholicism has a pope. Uh, Eastern Orthodoxy doesn't have one head over the entire Eastern Orthodox world. They have a, a synod. So there's the Russian Orthodox Church. There's the Greek Orthodox Church. There's the American Orthodox Church. Um And in uh, 2016, there was an official schism between the Russian Orthodox and the Ukrainian Orthodox churches uh, due to the the war that had been waging for a couple of years. So if Lord tarries, that's one that's going to be in the church history textbooks for Mm. centuries to come. Um, At any rate, that's kind of the the historical basis of it. Uh, Theologically speaking, They are um, a lot more mystical than we would be in the uh, the Protestant tradition. Uh, they're even more mystical than a lot of uh, Roman Catholics are, if that's uh, possible to imagine. Mm-hmm. Eastern Orthodoxy has sort of got a bit of a popularity in the United States among millennials about a decade or so ago because of the mysticism and the uh, the novelty of it. You know, if you've never been in a Russian Orthodox church or an Eastern Orthodox church in general, uh, first thing whenever you walk in, you'll be amazed by the smell. Just the frankincense all in the oh yeah in the air and then they've got these uh icons all over the walls whenever they sing it echoes no pews they all stand up the whole time so they're known for this uh very mystical uh it's said that they pray the best which i really doubt because if you're praying to angels or to dead saints then you're not praying to god and you need to get your uh, prayer life adjusted uh they have priests whom you are to confess to, which is uh, wedging a man between the Christian and Christ. That is not acceptable. Their uh, soteriology is a really goofy, wacky thing. They uh, they would say God became man, so man could become God. Through a system of uh, theosis, uh, we could become more and more and more like a God in order to restore the uh, the image of God, which was tarnished at the partakers fall. Become partakers of the divine nature. Become partakers of the divine nature is another term that you'll hear. 
So it's a very works-based salvation. Uh, it's a very man-based religion. Uh, mm-hmm. They put man in place of God. They de-emphasize the Bible and instead hold uh, uh, patristic writings and traditions to a higher uh, higher degree of authority. Yeah. Well, there's also like this very like patriarchal, like masculine aesthetic to it. Uh, I mean, just recently in the news that there was a star, I don't know if you knew about it, there was, I think there was a hockey player who was, there was going to be a, like a pride night or something like that. And he absolutely refused. I don't know, do you, I don't know if you knew about this, but he just stood on, on his grounds of being, you know, a Orthodox Christian. And then I went to go find out later he was Eastern Orthodox. But I mean, people, people just love the fact that they pushed back and everyone like on NHL.com, I think every, his jersey completely sold out out of like all online vendors because people all of a sudden they found this representative but there Good is for him. yeah so there is the kind of like this that's very, an assault on a uh, marriage and yeah he's standing up for a divine institution right even if he's not a believer in christ right but um yeah there is sort of like this very a lot of people i think there is an appeal sort of there's a very masculine aesthetic and structure to it and i don't know if maybe would that sort of play into like why putin would sort of like utilize that to try and say hey this is a righteous cause to have the men go and be part of this sort of, from Putin's perspective, is it kind of like a holy war? Is he utilizing the Eastern Orthodox Church, or how how do how are these two two things like fitting together in this whole conflict? The uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church of all branches of Christianity, the Eastern Orthodox have the best beards. I mean, a Russian Orthodox priest has a beard that will just, I mean, it's it's great, man. Yeah, like, I've seen them; they're pretty gnarly. They've got some beards. They really do. But uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's all that masculine of a religion uh, because of its mysticism and its feely goody, uh, mm. the uh, the devotion to Mary, the putting Mary icons everywhere. I had an Eastern Orthodox friend who told me that that was uh, helping him get in touch with his feminine side, which is, uh, which is interesting. Hmm. The thing with the uh, with Putin and Eastern Orthodoxy is probably more related to tradition. So I mentioned earlier that the Eastern Orthodox world has a way of getting tied up into the government, right? So the uh, Holy Byzantine Empire, the Holy Russian Empire, the, the Tsars of old were very much wrapped up in liturgy. Whenever a new tsar would be appointed, it was a big liturgical process, uh, akin to what we saw recently with uh, King Charles and uh, the Church of England. So Putin is trying to, uh, if you will, uh, establish sort of a new version of the, uh, the the Holy Russian Empire, if you will, which tries to unite uh, people on racial grounds as well as religious grounds. Uh, the, the expressed purposes up front are that they want all Slavs to be Russian Orthodox under the Russian patriarchy, or at least Eastern Orthodox. Uh, however, some problems immediately uh, come out of this. One problem is that a lot of Russians uh, from the Russian Federation are actually not Slavic and not Eastern Orthodox, but rather they're Asiatic and is uh, Muslim, right? So the Republic of Dagestan, for example has a lot of uh, Asiatics, you wouldn't look at them and say, this guy is a Slav, but they're under the Russian Empire. They're not Eastern Orthodox, but they are Muslim. So a move that we're seeing Putin do, you can uh, watch his speech that he did, oh, February of this year. And he's doing a State of the Union address, and he's got everybody out there, and he's you know doing the whole thing, reading the, the paper, and the cameramen are pointing at different guys. And... He starts talking about the holy books and the camera points to to the uh, Russian Orthodox patriarch and some head imam, Muslim, that are sitting next to each other. And so Putin is phrasing, is uh, framing the, the conflict in Ukraine as an attack against the holy books. And then they they kind of they're, they're reframing this to where it's this Abrahamic, Eastern Orthodox, Muslim together kind of thing, which is contradictory in several senses. But they're trying to make it work. So that's kind of a thing that's going on. 
the uh, the Russian Orthodox Patriarch, Patriarch Kirill, has said that anyone who dies uh, in this war fighting for Russia has washed away his own sins, regardless of whether or not he is an Eastern Orthodox or an atheist or a Muslim. So there's currently a theological pull toward unity between Eastern Orthodoxy and Islam. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're both false religions that need to be responded to, but the fact that they're making that particular connection should be a giant red flag to anyone on the ground that Russian Orthodoxy is, is indeed a false religion because it's joining with uh, Islam, which proclaims a different God in the most explicit ways possible. Mm. Andrew, what, what questions do you have for Paul? Uh, what's in your mind? Uh, in terms of the, the the theology of Putin, uh, is he someone who claims to believe in God, or is he just uh, using the Russian Orthodox Church as like a figurehead? And does he does he say uh, through Russian propaganda that the war going on in Ukraine and with the Western world is a war against uh, what is it uh, critical race theory and things of that nature? Is like that what's attacking? Uh, the Russian Orthodox and uh, the holy books? Is it critical race theory? Is it wokeness? Is it those types of things? Like what, what exactly is, are they saying? It is. And uh, uh, this is where it starts to get uh, interesting uh, on the Ukrainian front, right? So uh, of course, Putin is a, is a former KGB agent. Presumably he was at least an atheist at that point in his life. And I see no reason to think that he has, um, become a monotheist since, uh, especially since uh, uh, presumably he is uh, influencing the Russian Orthodox Church to decide who gets to become the uh, the, the patriarch who's, who's saying these things, right? So uh, uh, to call him Eastern Orthodox in the sense of the word that uh, the, the true Eastern Orthodox outside of Russia, the Greek Orthodox or the American Orthodox, who who actually knows the doctrines and has studied the doctrines and is dedicated to the doctrines, as much as I disagree with them. Uh, to say that Putin is the kind of Eastern Orthodox that those guys would agree with would be uh, would be hard to imagine. Um, however, they are indeed uh, framing this as a holy war. Uh, there was an interesting uh, a propaganda video that went out. <laughs> There was a big uh, rally in uh, downtown Moscow, and one of the speakers started shouting out, this is a holy war, holy war. And when he did, from the cameras in the back, you know, you could see the, the crowd and everything, and you could hear them erupting in applause. Way, yay, holy war. Wow. And then a video was released of a guy in the, the audience that had his phone out, and whenever the same line came out, it was silent. Nobody was hollering. That goes back to the Francis. So there's a, there's a question then, uh, to what extent, uh, is it? Yeah. Right. Um, so it seems that that was being manipulated. Well, one of them was, it was it the, the, the phone or was it the, the mainstream there? So there's kind of a question as to whether or not the Russian populace is with Putin and to what extent. So there's kind of a question then of, um, of the Russian populace, uh, how many of them are sincere Russian Orthodox uh, people who follow that religion and how many are, are not. And then of those who are sincerely Russian Orthodox, how many of them are buying into this? And it's hard to tell. I, I've been trying to, to, to gauge that. I'm seeing a lot of support, a lot of really hateful things coming out of uh, the average Joe in Russia, but I, I don't want to try to pretend like I have a good feel for the the populace when I have several examples. So that that's kind of tough. Um, so is, uh, is, is Putin Russian Orthodox? E, kind of hard to tell. How do you define it? So what, what exactly is the nature of this holy war then? Is it critical race theory and critical theory and wokeism in short? Uh, I think the answer to that question is a yes. <laughs> they, they've said it in very, uh, very clear terms. Uh, uh, Putin has gotten up and, you know, said, look at what they're doing in the West. You know, they're uh, promoting the the, uh, the LGBTQ uh, plus agenda. Uh, this, this is what they're trying to promote. 
The, the scary thing is a video that I've recently seen released in Ukraine in support of the war. And it had snippets of uh, a gay pride parade and then snippets of uh, Nazi black and white footage from back in the 40s and then gay parade and Nazis, gay parade Nazis. Yeah. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, I kind of like that they're drawing a comparison between the gay parade and the Nazis because they have the same basis. But then they put a, sort of a, a line there in Ukrainian uh, saying something to the effect of just as we are fighting against the Nazis, we're going to fight against the homophobes too in support of uh, the, the whole gay awareness month and everything. So Russia is framing this as a war against the uh, the Western ideology, and it looks like a lot of uh, Ukrainians are buying into the Western ideology because of it. And mm. this is something that we on the, the missions front are going to have to be dealing with in a very serious way in years to come. Yeah, help, help, help me understand real quick, just because when I think of like critical race theory and the influence of Marxism in our country, I see that is almost like to Russia a good thing that that's happening to the West because it will eventually destroy like a free market society. It'll destroy the very foundation which our government exists on. Why would they be fighting against that instead of encouraging the destruction of the West through uh, just letting them ha have it? Like why, if, if this is the way communism is going to take the West, why is another form of communism fighting against it? Like, because I don't That's see Russia not fighting with China, and they have two different forms of communism, you know. So, the uh, back up a little bit. A, a mistake that you'll often hear said is that this is a conflict between the Russian military or the Russian government and the Ukrainian military or the Ukrainian government. It's not quite like that. This is uh, several people in the Russian government have actually come out and said. Uh, things like no mercy to the Ukrainian people. So it's actually an attack against Ukrainian people, the nation, right? It's an actual genocide. And there are several definitions of genocide, which Russia is fulfilling here. And because of the uh, question of how infiltrated it is into society, it is very reasonable to say that it is Russian society against Ukrainian society, right? Not just the top wigs. Okay, so it's the Russian people against the Ukrainian people. One step further, it is not only against the Ukrainian people, but it is against Western people as well. Uh, they see the West supporting Ukraine. Uh, they're framing Ukraine as Nazis, which is which is absurd. I mean, uh, Zelensky is a, is a Jew. No. <laughs> um, but they're framing this as a war against the, uh, the Western liberalism in favor of Russian conservatism. Oh. Do I need to go soon? Okay. How much they're time do you have? me out yet. Okay. I don't know. They haven't told me I, could, I have to go yet. So that's a good thing. Go for a, um, go for a what do you call it? A forgiveness versus permission. Yeah, this is good stuff, dude. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. Uh, so they are indeed framing this as a war against the uh, against the West, but the ideology of it is a little bit more complex. They're not just trying to collapse the West. What they're trying to do is draw a clear border between the between Europe and a new Russian Empire. Uh, this is where the idea of a multipolar world comes from. Yeah, that. Uh, That Russia should be independent of um, of Europe, that the Balkans, the Baltics should be under Russia, Europe should be its own thing, the United States should be its own thing. So it's offensive to them that America is using its hegemony and in influencing what's happening around the world. However, they themselves are forcing their will around the world. So it's it's a bunch of uh, hypocrisy on that front. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Hey, what's up, everyone? We love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis, but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you want to go to thecultistshow.com, there is a donate tab. You can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com. 
forward slash donate, and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have, have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, you either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. I, I think what's also interesting too, when you, you just sort of tie in like where houses fit into even like media, media manipulation, there was a video that I saw shared on a couple of different conservative outlets. I think one of them is called DC Drano and uh, you know, it's very conservative leaning pro Trump conservative. And he was posting these videos of, I guess, Ukrainian police in an Eastern Orthodox church, like arresting or like shutting down a church service. So the perception, you know, what they're trying to depict is like, Oh, you're seeing these parse clips. Well, that means that Zelensky is now, you know, a fascist, he's a dictator and he's trying to shut down all free speech and freedom of religion in Ukraine Right. I can see how there's an, there's sort of, you see someone inside it, you see, and especially with COVID, especially through the lens of COVID, when you see, you know, police people yeah. inside of a church, like health officials, we all, I think we all have that prejudice in that mind. So me, even for me, I see that I kind of knee jerk react to it. It seems to me that with everything you said, there's a very nuanced sort of context to where even you would see something like that taking place. You know what I'm, I'm referring to, right? That video. Yeah. Yeah. Help people understand the context of that. Well, we might show that share that on our social media as well too when we drop this episode. But help bring people and help people understand that. So two things to keep in mind. Um, first of all, whenever your country's at war, the uh, government is uh, justified in taking measures that would not be justified uh, when you're not in a state of war. Okay. Uh, in World War II. America rationed food so that they could feed the soldiers. Okay. And you have to go. If Biden was to come out and say we need to start rationing food today, uh, they give me five minutes. So, hey, let me ask you this real quick. Would you have it? Are yeah. you on a smartphone? Uh, I am. If you can, you like uh, how much bet juice do you have? If you leave here, can you reconnect via like the Zoom app? I can just take my laptop. Out into the front uh, porch. Let's do that. Let, yeah, let's do that real quick. <laughs> let's let do that real quick. And while you're doing I'm that, Jacoby talk. Yeah, uh, in, in that while, hey, while you're relocating, so. in Jacoby. Remember, we talked about this. Um, we talked about this when we were talking. I think at one. I think we did. <laughs> just about that video, or just sort of like the nature of the that the context of like Ukrainian soldiers inside of you know that Eastern Orthodox Church and the perception that oh, yeah. someone like myself. You know, well, like I, I'm, su uh, I'm susceptible. Yeah. A lot of a lot of people where you saw people were knee jerk reacting. I also saw people knee jerk reacting to a post like that. Yeah, it, well, it's help maybe while while uh, he's relocate while Paul's relocating. Give it, give us your thoughts on that, or even some of the stuff that Paul said as far as understanding the the complex nuance of the religious fervor both in Russia and Ukraine. You know, in relation to Eastern Orthodoxy. Um. Okay. Well. I don't know if I would address it so much in the context of religious fervor, although among certain individuals, you will find fervor uh, amongst any denomination or group. Um, I would more say that, like Paul was describing the general Eastern Orthodox different groups of believers with each having its own patriarch for a different country, you know, Russia, Ukraine, Greece, Romania, uh, so on and so forth. You always had a few factions that would have disagree with some ecumenical belief, like the Coptic Church. So they were considered heretical by the general group of Eastern Orthodox. And then you had, I think it was the Oriental Orthodox. They had a couple different views that were different. But the Russian Orthodox Church, they have, it's basically a veneer. There's a lot of evidence. I mean, I, I interviewed a several people and I heard it over and over again. Kirill is KGB. And this is like open information. So, you know, you, you hear it and you kind of question it because it's kind of like a hangover from the Soviet Union, you know, like I think a lot of people heard that during the Soviet era, the church was ran by KGB agents. 
But the fact is that the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church is still KGB. Now, I would personally venture to say there's probably sincere individuals in the church that God, by his grace, have saved despite whatever the false teachings in the church are. Uh-huh. But by and large, the like the Russian symbol is a two-headed eagle, which is the state and the church. And this is, it's basically another arm of the state. But that's what it is. And, and it's, oh. they just say, like, like Paul was pointing out how they say, if you die in this war against Ukraine, you will go to heaven. That's just bizarre. There's no scriptural support for that. You're atoning for your own sins by going to fight in the war against Ukraine or, you know, they, they, they think that the Western society is the antichrist or I don't, well, I don't know if they would say the Western society is the antichrist, but basically the faithful church in Russia is the restrainer against the antichrist is what yeah. they preach. So, you know, they just come up with whatever they can say. And most of the people that they're preaching to are village people who hear only Russian state media. And they have one church to choose from, which is the Russian Orthodox Church. They are literally brainwashed. These are simple, uneducated people that live in villages. I'm not saying they're bad people, even if, even if they hate Ukrainians. I, I would give them, I would think, extend mercy to them because they have just, you know, they're just simple brainwashed people with no education, stuck in a poor village in Russia. So that's what, that's how I view the Russian Orthodox Church. This is, it's basically a brainwashing machine. Oh, no, it's interesting, man. And it's, it's also interesting, and I'll Andrew, let you jump in here a second, and I just, maybe I resonate with this, not so much that I, and again, my knowledge is, is so, is probably very, is obviously very different from your vantage point, but I, I reflect back to, you know, when I was a bit younger during the early 2000s, and you think of like 9-11 and the war on terror, and sort of a lot of people who even who are Christians in the Middle East, even missionaries in the Middle East, there was sort of a conflict because you sort of felt this sort of national the American nationalism where it was, hey, you need to, you know, fight the terrorists abroad and you'd associate any sort of Muslim, you know, with the terrorism at that time, you know, associated with the nine eleven attacks. And you know, it was very, I remember like going over to a Middle Eastern country and my prejudices just from being a very pro, oh, you're back <laughs> outside the library. You there, yep. Oh, you got, you're on the mic, a live, live reporting from outside. <laughs> Andrew, it's oh, like, yes, downtown <laughs> Winniewood, Oklahoma. This, Andrew, is, uh, this is great. Andrew, it's like you with, uh, you're like weatherman Andrew, except, uh, except Andrew, he has a actual microphone versus whatever prop that you have. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I would, Paul, I would explain to him, you know, what he was explaining some of the, the complications of the relation between Eastern Orthodoxy and this whole uh, conflict. And maybe it was similar for me a little bit, just sort of, you know, being a Christian, but also being very influenced by, like, 9-11 was sort of my introduction by proxy into the world of Islam. And I remember in 2007, after just being a very pro-Bush and, all, uh, and very pro-Iraq war, pro-war on terror and then all of a sudden, really, God called my heart to go be uh, serve on a mission over there for a month. I think it was a month over in uh, Morocco, Africa. Like, I really struggled. I had to sort of disconnect myself from my Americanism, my sort of American nationalism, where I'm an American, I'm a conservative, right-wing, pro-support-the-truth Republican, versus I need to s disconnect from just seeing these people over here that I'm supposed to minister to as a Christian and, and potentially share the gospel with and be a light in the darkness. I need to see them as someone who needs Jesus versus, you know, a terrorist who might blow themselves up. And it took me like a lot of almost like deprogramming, like the four months, four weeks that I was there um, in this Middle Eastern country. Um, so it just goes to show that there's in this, it's, it's probably so I mean, maybe there's a parallel to that, when it comes to sort of being in Ukraine and trying to be a missionary there, understanding there's this unique culture, because even in this whole conflict, at the end of the day, there's going to be a point where Western media is going to move on to the next chapter. And, you know, U Ukraine's still going to be there. 
And you guys are going to, if you're both back there by then, you're going to have to figure out how to be salt and light, you know, post, you know, whatever, whenever this sort of closes the chapter as far as, you know, American media goes. Um, yeah, it just, it, it, it just, it, I think it's really pe- important for people to understand that. I'm really, I really, your guys' insight is just so fascinating. Appreciate you. I wanna, uh, I, yeah, thanks. Uh, I just want to say I think that's so valuable because despite whatever, even, let's say Zelensky's totally corrupt. Let's say uh, Ukraine is doing bad things and Russia is doing bad things too. But I just want to say that most of the people I met here, yes, a lot of them don't accept Christianity, but they don't necessarily reject it either. I have a lot of friends who are very friendly with me despite knowing my beliefs. Like, mm-hmm. I make it very, very clear. Yeah. I taught it to them. And uh, just in my general experience in 12 years, uh, uh, Ukrainians are good people, like, by and large. There's good people here, and they don't deserve what what is happening. Mm. We really, you know, like the I want to help them. Not, you know, there is definitely things here I don't like, like the orphanage industry and the abortion is terrible, and the the, the you know the hangover of the Soviet era corruption. But I've met a lot of people here, and they're I like them better than Americans usually yeah <laughs> to tell you the truth <laughs> so yeah paul I, let me uh, jump back to you so uh maybe just help us understand further the what you're talking about uh i'm not sure where you end when you had to leave the library but um yeah just try and continue off where you started help just uh, help our audience understand sort of the the nuance behind all of this and and what the challenges are for both the ukrainian christians who are over there um and also, even for someone like yourself who is trying to just reach that area, and you're going to be involved, you know, like I said, far long uh, after uh, Western media decides to move on to, you know, probably the dumpster fire in the 2024 election, which is all incoming. Looking forward to that. But anyways, give us your thoughts. Um, I forgot where I left off. I had to step yeah. out of the library. Yeah. Um, let's see. I've mentioned a couple of times the uh, the ideology of, of Russia. That's uh, probably something that's worth uh, bringing out a little bit to uh, both equip Americans whenever they're hearing uh, Russian propaganda or any pro-Russian talk and and trying to figure out what's going on, as well as uh, for Ukrainians or other Westerners that are being influenced by the ideology. So the the political worldview goes by a couple of names. One is uh, Neo-Eurasianism. One is multi-polarity. Uh, one is fourth political theory. The idea is that this is a political theory that has come after three previous political theories. The first political theory is liberalism, which is like classic liberalism. It's the ideas that the American founding fathers had. It emphasizes liberty and individuality. Uh, the second idea or the second political theory to come along was communism, uh, as articulated by Marx. The third was fascism, uh, so Nazis and uh, the Italian fascists get kind of clumped together, but a lot of that comes from the uh, Frankfurt School and that whole worldview. Uh, Marxism emphasizes society, whereas fascism emphasizes the state. So the, the Russian fourth political theory tries to take elements from each of those and try to combine it into a hybrid fourth political theory uh, that idealizes a multipolar polar world where we have a dozen uh, giant world powers rather than hundreds of individual nations. Um, part of the, uh, the National Socialist influence on that would be uh, a German philosopher named Carl Schmitt, who came up with a uh, geopolitical theology, which basically said that large land masses should be expansive to control large land masses. Uh, that was the idea with Hitler invading Poland. If uh, 
if the National Socialist ideas were inflicted only in Germany, that would have been very bad news for Germany, but it wouldn't have necessarily caused people to die in Poland or Ukraine or uh, any other direction. So the Russian thought of extending borders very much comes from the, the National Socialist perspective. Mm. Um, the criticisms that the uh, Russian political uh, theorists are making of the West is that the West have become uh, so liberal, so individualistic, that now the individuals are being able to identify as individual genders, for example. Yeah. Uh, so if that's all that you're hearing, if you're saying the West has become very individualistic to the point of each individual having his own gender, yeah, there's something in that that, that needs to be called out. Uh, the problem is that the Westerners who are really pushing the 2S LGBTQIAA plus agenda are not doing it from the liberal framework of classic liberalism that the founding fathers worked on, but they're actually a lot closer to the national socialist side of things, the third political theory, which emphasizes the state over the individual, hence the obsession mm. with using the state to enforce the will on the individuals. Now, the, the German Nazis, they didn't have uh, this whole bit about every individual trying to change his gender identity. But it came from the same Frankfurt School that the rest of the National Socialism came from. And hmm. the whole gender identity politics is just a continuation of that. So it turns out then that the, uh, the leftist uh, worldview, politically speaking, is very much tied to this idea which the the, the Russians are calling fascist, mm -hmm. and rightly so because of its emphasis on the state. And it happens that the same Russians that are criticizing it are pulling off of fascism in order to make their expansive yeah. multipolar political worldview work. So right. it turns out that the left and the Russians are two sides of the same coin. So if you're siding with one, you're really aligning ideologically with the other, even though you have minor disputes. Mm -hmm. If you hold to a biblical worldview, which tends to support America's conservative values with plenty of criticisms, we've got all sorts of stuff we can criticize about. Oh, yeah. About America. Nobody's pretending otherwise. If that's your idea, if you're a right winger, if you're an American first that is truly consistent, then you're the one who stands apart from both the left and Russia. Mm. So it's important to see those two as being more similar and our biblical political worldview as being the, the different one. Yeah. Andrew, um, it's interesting. Andrew, I want to get your thoughts on this, Andrew. You think about all the prep that you did, uh, you and Wade did to kind of prepare yourself for Utah. Um, and it's uh, you think about all the different sociological, you know, the political climate and all the things of understanding of planning a church there. And you kind of does that? Do you feel like you kind of resonate with everything that we've we've learned so far about the complexity of just the nature of Ukraine and Russia and like the religious climate? You know, it's almost. What do you think about that? What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I'd say that the Mormon religion has already capitulated to the government so much that uh, while that I'm in Utah, I still feel like I'm in the United States of America. I'd say Utah was probably different uh, around the 1880s uh, than it is now, just because, again, of that capitulation of the LDS organization. But I do find similarities here in terms of how the certain organization has so much influence on the political lives of individuals. Uh, also, in terms of just a cultural LDS individual or a cultural Mormon, uh, sounds very similar to people that most likely even exist in Russia, that there's this Russian Orthodox uh, head or part of the state. And a lot of people just say, yeah, that's just kind of culturally what it's like. I, I'd say it's very similar uh, here, but I find that the one of the most interesting premises is that any false religion or any false belief uh, eventually will get molded into some type of form of government. They'll, they'll, there won't be a biblical separation of church and state because there's no God to keep it separated. Uh, Jesus Christ is the one who's king of kings and lord of lords, and he is the one who judges nations in the present, and he will make sure that his forms of government that are given through biblical standards will ultimately survive in the end. Uh, but 
what I find interesting is if you think like Islam or even Hinduism with a caste society, then we go to a false belief of this Russian Orthodox when there's no true God behind it, it all just molds into the state. Uh, and we find that that's happened here also in Utah. Uh, the eldest organization is so heavily involved in local politics here, but I'd say it's to the detriment, uh, of the the state here in Utah, because when people get burned by the LDS organization, then they 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 fling so far to the left that it's not even funny. Like this, uh, this is a very conservative state, but at the same time, when you get closer to downtown, uh, closer to the individuals here, they they swing so far left. It's uh, it's uncanny. It's, but it's it almost really like is, and so. the, and given given the mis the understanding of just the how the media has framed this whole Ukraine narrative, the closer you get to downtown Utah, the more Ukraine flags that you see, because right. it's almost sort of like in a weird way for like for you guys even prior to this, this is just you know your where you guys live and where you really take you know you have your friends and colleagues and you know your pride and your national you're both sort of sporting those colors and you take a very different identity where if I went to somewhere in Alabama, it'd be like me wearing a Ukraine flag. It'd be me, me like drinking Bud Light. You know, it's almost takes that <laughs> association if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. But um, hmm. yeah, let me ask you this with all of this. And it could, you've talked about Russia being the enemy, Russia propaganda. Do you think even with the passions you guys have surrounding this, do you think there's a challenge between not seeing people who are Russian as like your enemy, not seeing them as image bearers of God first versus, you know, a potential threat, a potential enemy. Like how do you, how do you, na- how do you navigate that? Like in all of this, cause I'm sure there's a lot of people who are, have really struggled with that themselves because, you know, that's so interconnected. You guys are literally next door neighbors. H- how do you guys navigate that as Christians? Um, Well, I've actually uh, challenged people on this uh, point because I saw so many Ukrainians literally just hateful towards Russians. Mm. And they would say, Putin is not doing this. Russians are doing it. They're allowing it. And to an extent, they have a point. I mean, a large percentage of the population is going along with it, but there's a nuance there. There's a delicacy there. And uh, basically, it's that, like, I think it's 250,000, roughly, Russians fled when uh, uh, Putin signed the, like, uh, enforced mobilization. They fled the country. So yeah. there's a quarter of a million people who said, no, I don't want to fight in this war. Um, and then you had, like, uh, several uh, opposition media stations that left Russia since 2022 and about 500, I think, independent journalists. I don't remember the exact number, but the point is, uh, and and then anybody that went, it was a relatively small number compared to the overall population of Russia, but there were several thousand protesters who were all beaten and thrown in jail Mm -hmm. and quickly silenced. So, uh, I actually, it was interesting because uh, in the first month of the full-scale invasion, I was in Kishinev, Moldova, and I was going to a barber there, and we would chat. Um, he had he had pretty good English, and he was from Russia. And he told me that his friends would basically, you know, they might be opposed to the government, but uh, over time, they would realized that being a dissident would only result in some kind of uh, pain or repercussions. And then they just go along with it. And then eventually they just okay with it. So it's kind of like they, a lot of Russians, they just accept this is the way it is. And, you know, and those are, those are the more, maybe the younger people that have some education in university and they're thinking more through the things they just go along with it. But then you have older people who are less educated. They're maybe less thinking critically about it. And they they tend to think of like Putin as like they'll criticize people under Putin, but they'll never criticize Putin. Mm. So like Putin is spotless. He, he can do no wrong kind of a thing. So um, uh, this is, um, but the Ukrainians, 
they will um, basically like one of my friends is actually a good friend. He he was kind of hateful towards all Russians. If you yeah. have to understand, they are doing a lot of damage here. They are blowing up homes. Mm -hmm. They are blow. They are doing so much damage here. If you wanted to attack a country, why would you do it this way? Right. There's no explanation for what he's doing. And so the Christians have this uh, just hate sometimes. And but basically what he said to me was like, he finally explained it. Actually, I had to kind of pry this out of him. It was, no, we don't hate all Russians. It's just the Muscovites. And what he described as Muscovites is those who are going along with this, you know, all Kremlin propaganda, this whole narrative and everything. So right. he differentiated between all Russians the muscovites but it was kind of hard for me to get him that out of him but yeah yeah so um i think that the the christians and maybe even a lot of probably not a lot of non-christians they understand that not all russians are bad but they're very emotional mm. about the situation right now so oh, i appreciate this sharing that paul is there anything you could add to that i tend to have a bit of a uh, more uh Cynical view, I guess. <laughs> yeah. In America, I don't trust the, the public school system. Mm -hmm. And America is a lot more free than Russia is. In America, I don't trust the, the average uh, secular university. Yeah. And America is a lot more free than Russia is. The uh, public school system and the university is a, is a giant uh, propaganda brainwashing machine that even here in the West where we are more free is not particularly trustworthy so why am i going to trust the uh the russian public school system and the russian universities right so even if we have someone who is uh, an educated russian okay where did he get his education probably from the russian public school followed by a russian uh university i mean uh, i follow uh, russian professors on uh, academia i see what they're writing Mm -hmm. they, those aren't the kind of guys that I would trust with uh, with the generation of humans, right? I'm not convinced that the uh, the average Russian is necessarily a good guy in, in the sense of uh, how we're obviously on a theological sense. We are all born spiritually dead and in need of a savior. We're all born mm -hmm. on a path to hell, and every single last one of us needs to be uh, detoured and believe in Christ, right? Yeah. That's what I want most for all of my loved ones. It's what I want the most for every stranger and for all of my enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, if Russians would believe in Christ and have a consistent worldview, they wouldn't be able to fall for this nonsense that's going on in Russia because it's a, it's a contradictory worldview with the, with the Bible. Uh, but it, it would seem uh, logical to, to say that uh, the... Uh, Average Russian is, is probably a little suspicious mm -hmm. of his government. We all are, right? Yeah. Uh, take your favorite president from your lifetime, right? You could criticize him, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing in Russia. Some more Even than if others. you can't vocalize it. Yeah, some more than others, right? <laughs> uh, I'm not particularly fond of our current president. I got more criticisms of him than the previous presidents. Mm -hmm. But we are changing presidents. We got a good system here. I would imagine that if you walk up to the average Russian, he might not be able to freely express himself yeah but uh he'll express at least a superficial disagreement with putin that doesn't necessarily mean he's a good guy though right so uh i'm a little bit more cautious in assuming good out of people yeah especially when they are uh, predominantly trained by uh an evil system like uh, like russia Sorry for interrupting your currently scheduled programming, but did you know you can go to ApologiaStudios.com and become an all-access member? With all-access membership, you get exclusive content from all of Apologia Studios productions. Not to mention Cultish is an Apologia Studios production, so you'll get access to Cultish, the aftermath where Jerry and I talk together after our most recent series discussing what we thought. It's really cool. We have a lot of fun doing it, and you know we can't do this without the studio. It keeps the lights on. And we can't also do this without you. So please go to ApologiaStudios.com and become an all-access member. Now back to the programming. 
it yeah, kind of makes me it may kind of makes me think jerry uh like the difference between like a love and a hate it's like i could be totally wrong on this guys i'm just thinking off of off the fly here but in terms of saying someone's going to come and they break into my house and they want to kill my family i think my initial inclination would not be i'm going to kill this person because i hate them it would be actually i'm going to fight to defend my family because i love yeah. them and i'm supposed mm-hmm. to because that's who god has given me in terms of a relationship between two countries at war, I would I would see uh, it would be a very similar thing. I think the way uh, to break the bonds of not hating individuals is to understand that uh, we should have a commonality as individuals, right? Uh, being fallen, of course, but like Paul was saying, and Jacoby, that's why he's he's living in Ukraine, is that to preach the gospel to save the individual so they can be self-governing individuals so that the nations can change that way. It's like Isaiah 2 uh, in terms of Jesus Christ and the gospel bringing peace and turning swords into plowshares, but that can only really happen through regeneration. Like It takes God dying on the cross and t- changing our hearts in order for us to not be people haters and think that we're our own individualistic mm. gods uh, yeah. in in general it's like how do you separate russia from the russian well the way you do that is by saying god can save this individual so i'm going to preach the gospel to them but if they come to try to kill me i love god i love my family and i'm going to protect them yeah if, if that mm-hmm. makes sense does that make sense guys i don't know absolutely well, uh, okay yeah gk chesterson said don't fight uh he said, "Fight because don't fight because you hate what's in front of you, uh, but because you love what's behind you." Ah, okay, yeah. Mm. So, and uh, I think that sometimes Ukrainians are—they do have a hatred for Russians, especially the aggressive ones who are coming with guns. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, at the same time, they have a love for their country and for their family, and they're fighting for what they love. So maybe it's not so simple as either or. Maybe they have a, a hate and a love at the same time. Yeah. Of course, the the goal should be you know, you know not to hate, but um, I guarantee not all the soldiers are Christians. So we can, yeah. No, it's something. Yeah. That, yeah. What I meant to I think what I where I before I lost my train of thought what I where I was going while well, I was thinking of just World War II, uh, specifically the war in the uh, Pacific with uh, Japan. And if you look even some of, at some of the U.S. propaganda and the way that they depicted Japanese people, I mean, I look at him like, my goodness, that is awful, mm-hmm. you know. But you think now, Japan's like one of our greatest allies. Like they love us and they love baseball, you know. It's like over there, one of the guys that goes to our church, he played baseball in Japan, and they are fanatics. It is crazy over there in comparison to American baseball. It's so different. But I'm sure there are even people who are Christians back then were like, how do I navigate? I'm supposed to fight for my country, um, you know, and protect the homeland in a sense and, and, and do my duty. But also, I want to these people are image bearers of God. I'm sure there's people who, who have probably in every, every international conflict, there's always been complication to it, you know? Um, and so I think that's just something we have to navigate out. So I think the biggest takeaway for this is just to help people understand that in any situation when it comes to media, that there's so many different angles, it's best to try and look at things holistically um, and and not just knee-jerk react to some parsed clips. Um, and ultimately, if you're a Christian, you know, it, the goal is to really just pray for peace and for reconciliation, not in a, in a physical sense that there would be uh, resolution to this war where people would stop dying, people would stop fighting and killing each other, but also just be praying that in the midst of this, you know, people like yourself would be able to be salt and light and that the gospel would even flourish in an area that's dark, dark by way of just war, um, physically, but also in the spiritual places, you have this, you know, gospel, false gospel that's being propagated, you know, people that are, you know, maybe they're religious nationalistically, but they don't really understand what it's like to actually have a relationship with Jesus and to have his righteousness to repent of your sin and put your trust in him. So I, I really appreciate you guys taking a lot of, uh, taking the time here, um, just real quickly, uh, Jacoby, we're, we're going to wrap up here and, and Paul, let you give your final thoughts. You are involved. You've got a charity that you do. I remember seeing pictures of the camp that you did over in California with Ukrainian refugees. Just tell anyone, tell, uh, tell everyone about that real quickly. Uh, did you say, no, not, not in California, in Carpatia. Carpatia. Yes. <laughs> it sounds kind of similar. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. In the Karpatian Mountains. Okay. So there's a mountain range over here in in a western Ukraine, and so we do a camp there in the summer, and uh, every year um, we do it. Actually, two of them. Our church does one. We help them with that, and then we do our own camp. Last year we did a, a youth camp. This year we're doing a family camp, and uh, that's just one of the ministries uh, that we do here. My wife currently works with the humanitarian organization. We serve the local church a lot and another church in a village nearby. I preach at our church once a month and and, and the church uh, an hour south of here. And then we do a little English club and we, we basically try to find creative ways to build relationships with people and just serve. Um, and so we did in, in Odessa for like over eight years, we did English clubs and camps, various di- kinds of camps. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, you were mentioning baseball being popular in Japan. And I have a bunch of bats and gloves. I, I still need a few more gloves. But uh, I one of my dreams is to start a baseball league here, nice. possibly someday. So. Mm. I taught some kids last summer at camp to play, and they really liked it, except for the girl who got hit in the head with a bat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jacoby. Oh, boy. Hey, hey, Jacoby. <laughs> Swinging if, the bat around. <laughs> if, any, if any of our listeners felt led to, like, donate or anything like that to the ministry that you have out there, where could they go? Where could they find you? Uh, missionimpactalliance.org slash give. Um, and if you want to go towards something specific, you can make a note like uh, we can give it towards humanitarian aid or, or towards a soldier or just the ministry in, in general so awesome awesome we'll, 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 have, we'll have some links too when we drop this episode as well too um paul any last thoughts you have uh from yourself that you could kind of give on this whole discussion as we kind of wrap up here everything you, by the way everything you've said has been so eye-opening and insightful man i've really appreciate you taking the time both here in the library and also outside the library <laughs> I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity. I appreciate the the chance to talk about this openly. A lot of folks have uh, already made up their mind and haven't really thought through it, or a lot of folks are struggling with it and, and trying to figure out what in tarnation is going on. Obviously, we can't trust the leftist media, so where exactly do we go? And the answer to that question is the Bible. Uh, whatever it is that we're hearing, be it from the media, the left, the right, the whoever, Weigh it against the Bible. As long as we're sticking to the Bible, that's our authoritative source of truth. That's the one that's not going to lead us astray. It might be difficult to, to figure out what exactly about the Bible is applicable here or there, but that's the one that we can trust. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, pre- thank you guys so much for taking the time. Uh, Jac- Jacoby, it's, uh, what is it, like 3 o'clock in the morning now? It's almost... Uh, 234. Is, this, is, is this, it okay if I say one thing? Yeah. It was just sorry. right. Before, yeah, I'm it's sure been, you, you got to get you in before the sun comes up over in Ukraine. <laughs> it's just, you asked this one question to Paul, and I was like, "Oh, I really want to answer this question." I'll go for it, man. And it was about I can't remember how you phrased it exactly, but it was basically about why are we bringing uh, uh, cultural Marxism in the states to, uh, verse, and then at the same time we're fighting communism in Russia, something. Uh, something yeah, like that. I think it was essentially, said, yeah, it was like Russia, Russia's communistic or socialistic. And then we have the influence of Marxism and uh, whatever is critical race theory. Why, yeah, so why is Russia fighting against it if it's going to destroy us? You know, I think this is actually so key because I was uh, asking the same question because I started researching George Soros. And he believed in a philosophy from Karl Popper called open society. So uh, essentially, first of all, he teaches that you can't know anything for sure. So you must be perpetually skeptical about everything. You can't prove anything, but you can only disprove things. So there's no absolute truth. There's no objective knowledge. It's just like perpetual skepticism. And an open society is one that has a variety of ideas, and they're all kind of sharing these ideas to evolve, to try to get closer to reality. But the weird thing is, is how do you know what reality even is in such a system? 
and then so he he came since the late 80s he was he george soros funding was behind many of the color revolutions in the arab nations and in uh yugoslavia and ukraine and he even had a hand in uh the fall of the soviet union so um there's a book called the man behind the curtain what was written by uh dan something he works with uh or not no he works the guy works with dan bongino if you know who that is he's like his right hand man he wrote a book called the man behind the curtain and uh he explains a lot of this so anyways i was trying to figure out why george soros played a big hand in helping to topple communist regimes or uh eastern european regimes and then he comes to america and he does the opposite he uses actual like cultural marxism to fight the government well the reason why is because he hates anything that claims to be uh have a hold on a, a absolute truth mm. so america by the declaration of independence you know says that we uh uh gosh Inalienable uh, rights. To... Yep. Yes. Uh, so he's basically saying, no, this isn't good. Uh, anyone who's nationalist is dangerous. Anyone who's autocratic is dangerous. And he floods all these Arab refugees into all these European countries just to create this chaos so he can break them down. He can break down all these kind of autocratic, what he views as autocratic powers, and God knows what the next plan is. And so sometimes it seems like he's doing good things, but the long-term plan equates to chaos. And that's literally what he's trying to do. He thinks it will be good for society. So it kind of goes back to like Karl Popper said that anyone who, you must be always tolerant of all ideas, but if someone is intolerant, then you must be violent against them mm. because the intolerant must be removed from society so everyone is tolerant. So mm. it's kind of self-contradictory. Mm. Uh, no, and this is basically like Soros's hero. Interesting. Uh, well, yeah, I think yeah. maybe the biggest takeaway, and I appreciate you sharing that, man, is just to understand that you know, worldview, worldviews have consequences, and that is another intricate layer of people who are bringing – you know, their different worldviews. I think just to wrap up here is uh, Francis Schaeffer talked about in one of his uh, lectures, A Christian Manifesto. He'd always talk about how people see all these separate issues in part, uh, but they're they're not viewing it as one. They're not zooming out and seeing the big picture. All right. So uh, I appreciate you again of taking the time. Uh, like I said, the sun's probably coming up in Ukraine. So I'm going to let you get a little bit of shut eye <laughs> um, and, and get on you know, with your busy day. Again, one last time. Thank tell you people, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Tell people the link one last time people can go to if they want to help with the charity stuff that you're involved in. Uh, missionimpactalliance.org. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all for listening in. Definitely comment on your social media. Let us know what you thought. I'm sure there's a lot more we could kind of go into, and uh, but I'm sure you guys kind of get on with your busy day. So again, appreciate you guys making the time, and we'll talk to you guys all next week on Cultish. Talk to you all soon.